I haven't made an update on Facebook in a long time, and it's not because I haven't had anything to say. Uh, quite the opposite, I actually have had quite a lot to say. A lot, lot has happened in the last month or so. I didn't want to make a page-long post that no one would read. I didn't know how to do a long update that would be interesting enough for for somebody to, to, to follow through to the end. So <laughs> I got this genius idea of doing a video because um, I figure, well, if people get to look at my pretty face while I'm talking, maybe that'll be more engaging. So I decided to do these weekly episodes where I talk about whatever I find interesting. Each Friday, I pick whatever is the most um, interesting thing to me at the time and, and, and just talk about that for a bit. For this first episode, I'd like to talk about learning how to fly a paramotor with anxiety. That's the thing I'm an expert in. There was a long time between learning how to fly for my training and getting my gear up and working and the weather cooperating and actually getting the opportunity to go fly. And in that time, I had gotten pretty anxious about the sport. And I used some tricks from an article that um, I'll post a link to in the description that actually got me up in the air. It was quite a feat. I mean, I, I, I wanted to vomit the whole day. I was very nervous when I was loading up the car my heart was pounding so bad I could feel it in my my neck like it was hard to swallow. I can't remember ever being that nervous before in my life. But I got the gear in the car. I, I used these tricks. I um, got out to the field and I launched and I got up in the air. And I had probably my longest flight ever. I flew for about 55 minutes and got a lot of cool pictures and had a good time and got down on the ground safely. I didn't I didn't get hurt or break anything. So it was it was a good day. And a month later, I was getting ready to to fly again. I made I, we had another perfect day. I made plans with a friend of mine named Tom who is a uh, the only pilot I know in this area. During that day, actually, my anxiety was probably only about 5% what it was the time before. And I consider that a major victory. I was well on the way of lowering the anxiety. And I, I figured with each flight, I would get less and less anxious about it. And over time, I would actually be comfortable with flying. Unfortunately, while trying to manage my anxiety and get myself out on the field or out at the airport, actually, I was rushing myself because I was I was anticipating getting more anxious and I, I thought, well, if I, you know, if I hurry up, I knew once I got on the road, I'd be fine. So when I was loading up the car, I rushed. I triple checked everything. I mean, I had everything in the car and, and the motor was, was mounted to the back and, and all that was fine. But I had, <laughs> I had forgotten to put shoes on. I was about 10 minutes from the airport when I realized I was wearing my slippers. I was already running late. Tom was waiting for me at the airport, so I, I decided that other people that launched in without shoes, I, I'd go for it myself, and it proved to be a mistake. Another mistake I had made was when I was fueling up at the airport, I forgot to tighten up my gas cap. I was anxious, and I wasn't able to focus on the task at hand. My head wasn't in the game, and I wasn't concentrating on what I was doing, and I made two really stupid mistakes. I forgot to put my shoes on, and I forgot to tighten my gas cap. And the end result was I wasn't able to run fast enough to keep up with the motor. And when I got off the ground, I actually did get off the ground for a second, um, my feet kind of got, you know, swept, doing this the wrong way, kind of got swept up behind me, and I should have been running longer than I did. And th there was another kind of aspect to this. I had this bad, bad habit of jumping into my seat. And it's, it's something I was aware of. It's something that Tom had pointed out because uh, he had saw my last launch. The advice he gave me was when you think you're done running, you have, you have one more step. And that was, he, he was exactly right. This, this is, was the situation in this case. I got off the ground, but I had one more step to do. 
and uh, my feet were kind of swept up behind me. So instead of taking another step and getting up, you know, launching into the air, I did a face plant at full power and slam, you know, got slammed into the ground. And, um, you yeah, know, I didn't get hurt. I scraped up my leg. What really added to the whole thing is that my gas cap came off. I got covered in gas. And that's, I, I, I didn't enjoy that very much. And then when I got up, I noticed that I'd also broken my prop. So I had another, my third broken prop and I was covered in gas. I wasn't, I was feeling, I was feeling pretty discouraged. My anxiety was interfering with my ability to concentrate on my pre-flight checks and just preparing to get in the air. That's dangerous. That is the situation I don't want to be in. I don't want to risk my my safety, my life or health um, over the fact that I can't I can't focus because I'm I'm too anxious. So I decided for better or worse, I don't know if this is a good idea or not, but I decided to um, to take a time out and to to really just deal with the anxiety head on and not just try to power my way through it. And I'm I'm so glad I did. I am in a much better place than I was back then. I, I was in such a bad place and I knew it and I was hoping that if I could find a a sport that I was into, you know, a reason to be out of the house, you know, something to do that I could either get up in the air and and find my serenity that I was searching for. Because really that's that's what I was looking for is peace of mind. And it wasn't working. I it was I feel that I was endangering myself by by forcing myself to be um to do something that my brain was telling me not to do. And even though the incident wasn't, it wasn't terribly bad. I mean, I got covered in gas and I broke a prop. But um, I, in the days following, I was starting to have anxiety about anything to do with paramotors. I unfriended um, about 50 pilots on Facebook. I stopped following all the YouTube channels, just the site of paramotors was causing me to feel anxious and, and sometimes even have outright panic. Something was wrong. By trying to force myself to do something that I was afraid of, I was actually making the situation quite worse. Um, so I decided to do um, a few things, and, and that's what this video is all about, is is what I've learned from the last month and a half, from, from analyzing my fear about the sport and doing what I should have done a long time ago. It, it'd be really nice if this video ended up being uh, watched by somebody who is thinking about learning how to fly and maybe have, um, you know, a history of anxiety. And hopefully, you know, what you learn from this video um, will keep you from getting into the same situation that I got into or maybe just at the very least be some form of entertainment. I took the time to boil down the things that caused me to be anxious about the sport and, and kind of like, you know, analyze it and think it's like, what, what, what should I really have done differently? You know, considering that aspect. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about those areas and what I, I feel like I should have done differently. The first one being the wing. When you watch somebody launch on YouTube who's experienced and knows what they're doing, they take one step backwards and the wing immediately pops up over their head and sits patiently and waits for them to turn around and take a couple steps and walk off into the sky. It wasn't like that um, when, I, when I was learning how to kite. The wings were heavy. They uh, were wet from dew. Uh, from the grass, and they were they they were hard to get up in the air. And once I did get them up in the air, they wanted to just dive to the side. That affected my trust in the sport because the thing that was supposed to hold me up in the air didn't seem to want to stay up in the air. Before anybody comments and you know tries to explain that, you know the stability of the wing is you know from the weight of the pilot on it, and you know it's all different in the air. I I, I totally get that. You you really don't need to explain. How paramotors work in or the 
pair of wing works. This is, um, <laughs> you know, things I've, I've been through training. I, I totally, I've, I've read the Bible, the, um, the, um, this, if you don't have this, get this, by the way, this is, this is worth its weight in, in gold. Um, so I understand the mechanics behind it, but the inside of your brain that, you know, determines whether you're in danger or not has its own logic and you can't, you can't reason with that. You can't reason somebody out of being afraid of somebody. You know, if somebody, uh, you know, sees a spider, for example, and they're, you know, they have this involuntary reaction that, you know, tells them that they're in danger, it, you know, what it's already happened. You, you can't, you can't go back and say, well, you shouldn't fear spiders because you're bigger than them. You know, it, 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 it doesn't work that way. There's, there's, there's a big difference between the logic that you can understand with your prefrontal cortex and, and the logic that your inner brain is using to determine if you're in trouble or not. I guess I don't really need anybody to explain how it works. I, I, I totally get it. But thinking back, I can remember what my level of anxiety was at each step. And that told me, it's like, okay, what was bothering me on day one? What was bothering me on day, you know, five? And, and, and by doing that, I was able to boil down what it was that made me go from super excited about learning how to fly and being so freaked out by it that I can't even look at a picture of a paramotor. What I would have done differently is, um, now this is advice I hadn't taken for myself. This, this particular piece is something I haven't done for myself. But I would have invested in a kiting wing. They're, I don't even know if they were available at the time that I took my training. I did my training two years ago. At the time I did my training, I never even heard of a kiting wing. But I know that they are available now. They're not cheap. I'll put a couple links into in the description and you, you can check them out. Let's say I was just starting out and I was kind of just watching it on YouTube and I was really getting serious about learning how to launch. It, I would feel that it'd be worth the investment to get a kiting wing, you know, watch some videos on ground handling and just, you know, go to the park and, and figure it out. It's a lot like learning how to ride a bike. Somebody who knows what they're doing makes the corrections so, so immediately that it's it's microscopic. You You can't even see it with the naked eye. But if you don't know what you're doing, you're you're reacting too late, and you know the reactions that you need to make are, I should say, the compensations that you need to make make are either exaggerated or too little or too late, and um, and it's a lot harder if you don't know what you're doing, and that's what you're up against when you're when you're learning how to kite is is try to do something so much so that you can get it in your muscle memory so that you react without without it having to be conscious. And once you get to that point, then kiting is a breeze. Um, the next thing on the list is the motor. The paramotor itself, it's pretty heavy and it's loud. For something that you're going to wear on your back, it's <laughs> it's probably the, the loudest, heaviest thing that you're going to wear as a backpack. And um, to make matters way worse, it has a gigantic spinning, you know, rotating blade on the back of it that will immediately mince anything that gets in its path. Now, once again, you know, you can logic that, you know, as long as you started on your back, you're, you're going to be safe and, you know, et cetera. But, yeah, you know, when in the times that I have done a face plant on a launch, the top thing on my mind is where the hell is that prop? Where is the giant rotating blade? And I've never got hurt by it, but it's it's enough to cause me to be anxious on a launch. What you can do differently, um, this is actually something I have done differently. Um, the the motor I, I trained on was the Air Conception Nitro 200. It's a pretty loud motor. The motor I bought is an Atom 80, which if you, um, if you get into training and you find that you really don't like the vibration or the noise, I would highly recommend checking out the Viterazzi Atom 80. It's a much quieter engine. For something you're going to wear as a backpack, I mean, it's, it's still pretty loud, but it's definitely at a level that doesn't cause me to be anxious when I'm wearing it. The blade, another another thing, you still have a giant rotating blade, and it pushes hard. As a matter of fact, I recently upgraded to a 130cm prop, and that thing pushes so damn hard, I have yet to get it up to full power. I can get it up to 9600 RPM, 
And that's it. I have to back up because at 9,600 RPM, my feet start like sliding again along the ground and, and that's leaning into it. I mean, that's, that's leaning in as much as I can trying to hold back that motor other than, you know, putting my foot up on a tree, which maybe I should try that as much as, <laughs> as I can hold back that motor can push even harder yet. I just saw a video where Tucker got, he was able to push his Ford, I think it was a 250 truck, but this gigantic truck, he was, he was able to push it just using a paramotor. And that, that's a cool video. So, you know, check that out. I mean, my point is, is that paramotors push really, really hard. To give you an idea of how hard a paramotor pushes, in, in the early 1990s, I went to a concert to see uh, David Lee Roth in Orlando, Florida, um, where I lived at the time. The opening band was Extreme, who I was a big fan of. My friends were fans of, um, but they weren't, they certainly weren't as big as David Lee Roth because David Lee Roth was in Van Halen. So during the opening act, there was, the stadium was empty and me and my friends had crap seats. And we decided that just for the opening act, we'd go down to some closer seats and check out the show from there. Of course, the people who whose seats we were borrowing, they showed up. There was no need to make a deal about it. I mean, all they had to do was announce their presence and we, we would have just got up and left. Um, but instead, they decided to make an issue out of it. I, I got up to, to leave and this guy came running at me and, and pushed me as hard as he could. His intent was to get me to eat cement. And it was everything I could do to keep my feet under me. And that shove was, that's how hard a paramotor pushes. I mean, that it's, it pushes you enough to knock you off your feet, without a doubt. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that takes some getting used to. So buying the Atom 80 is one thing that you can do differently. Another thing that you can do differently is um, do not follow the paramotor Facebook group. The videos on YouTube, they have, you know, a description or a thumbnail and usually give you some idea of what it is that you're getting yourself into. The advice I'm trying to give you here is that in your first, you know, year or so of, of learning how to fly, don't watch a lot of fatality videos. They have the best intentions. They're, they're trying to make other people learn from their mistakes, but they do this by posting gory pictures of mangled limbs and missing scalps and in all of this stuff that once you see, you, you can't unsee it. You really should avoid that because whether you even learn from it or not, it gets in your head. And it's one of those things, at least it got in my head, you know, when I'm thinking when, when, when things start to go a little bit sideways, I'm starting to see pictures of, you know, mangled limbs in my, my head. And, and that's really what I shouldn't, that's not where my head should be. So avoid that stuff. Your first year, you know, you're, you're gonna be in training, listen to your instructors, take their advice. They know this stuff. They're gonna tell you what to do and what not to do to avoid becoming, you know, one of these people who end up in the hospital or end up dead. Just follow that advice. And then when you get good at what you're doing, then you can explore into the darker side of the sport and, and, and learn from other people's mistakes. When you're learning, you wanna limit yourself uh, your exposure to that stuff. And you can't do that with the paramotor Facebook group because you're, you're scrolling through your feed and, you know, these pictures are mixed in with your feed along with, you know, pictures of your aunt's cats. And then all of a sudden you're looking at blood and gore. By the time you've seen it, it's too late. You can't un unsee it. Um, next on the list is the money. And I'm not talking about the, the cost of the gear or training because in my opinion, those things are worth it. If you want to get into aviation, uh, para, uh, <laughs> the cost of a paramotor and some training is, that's the cheapest price of admission. You're not going to get into aviation for, for anything even close to that. So I, I think that those things are, are totally worth it, especially the training. If you're going to put a price tag on your safety, it should be a lot higher than the cost of training. And if not, then you're either paying too much for training or you're, you have a death wish. What I'm talking about in particular is the repairs. I've had 16 flights so far and I've broken three props. I've split a gas tank. I've bent two frames. I've spent $2,500 just in repairs. And that's enough to be in my head when I'm getting ready to launch. I'm wondering, am I gonna screw this up? And if I do screw this up, 
you know, do I have to spend hundreds of dollars to learn another stupid lesson? Um, next on the list is my kids. If you have children, you might already know what I'm talking about. And if you don't have kids, then you probably don't. I mean, to love something more than life itself is, is life-changing. When I'm preparing to go out to fly, at some point, the thought pops into my head, is this going to be the last time that I ever see my kids? I feel selfish. I feel like I'm risking their security. I feel like I'm, I'm chancing them growing up without a father so I could go fly over a bunch of farm fields. And, and I feel selfish, and I feel like... It's not worth it. I wish there was a switch. I wish I can turn that off, but I can't. You, you can't stop being a parent. I, I wish I had advice for this one, but I, I just don't. Um, next on the list is the sensation of flight. Uh, and even more specifically, the lack of control that you have over yourself when you're in the air. On my first flight, I launched into a strong headwind and um, ended up parked over a, a row of trees. And um, I wanted to move forward relative to the ground. Now I get, I get, I was moving relative to the air. You don't need to explain that to me. Um, obviously, I was moving relative to the air, but um, I wasn't moving relative to the ground, and that was the first time where I didn't feel like I was in control of of the situation, and it made me feel anxious. And um, so I turned to get out of the wind and I ended up going downwind into some rotor. That's when I felt my first turbulence. It wasn't bad, but it was enough. I was about 300 feet over the ground and something grabbed me and was, you know, shaking me around and it, uh, it was enough to make me not feel comfortable. I was pretty freaked out and after a while of that, I was, I'd say about 10 minutes of that, I was ready to, uh, to be back on the ground. Once I did get back on the ground, I really wasn't in a hurry to get back up there. Fortunately, I had fantastic instructors. My instructors were great. They were supportive. My classmates were supportive and did a fantastic job at getting me not not just up in the air, but but making me a good pilot. I was good at takeoffs. I was good at landings. They did an amazing job with what they had to work with. I would recommend them to anybody. What I wish I would have done differently, I wish I would have done a tandem flight before my first flight. My first flight was also a, my first solo flight. Um, the first time I went up, I went there up by myself. If I would have done a tandem flight before that and had a chance to get used to the sensation of flight, with someone else being in control, it would have been a huge step forward towards me preparing myself for this, the feeling that you can't, you can't teach it to somebody. You can't describe, I mean, you can try to describe the sensation of flight to somebody, but there's nothing else like it. I mean, probably the closest I felt to it is being on a roller coaster. It's, it's a lot of motion and there's a lot of things that you don't really quite register in your head until you're up there. It's kind of like being on a swing set. The top of, you know, the swing doesn't move very much, but the, you know, obviously the bottom part moves quite a bit and the wing can be you know, perfectly rock steady and in, in having, you know, you know, just barely moving at all, but you're, you're moving quite a bit and you don't really register that you're, you're, you know, in the seat and all of a sudden this, the seats, you know, kind of rocking side to side. And, um, it feels like quite a lot, but in, in the grand scheme of things, it, it isn't, <laughs> you're just moving a little bit and you, you get used to it over time when you're in training and you get, you know, I'd say on your fifth or sixth flight, you should, Try to search out some turbulence. Don't do something stupid. Um, you know, stay within your your um, level of control. But if you find a little bit of turbulence, you know, just kind of sit in it for a little bit, and just get just get used to the feeling, and and let your brain get used to that sensation. And you know, and that's how you learn that it's okay. It's it's not you're you're safe. You're you're not in danger. The next piece of advice I would give to a new pilot who's, um, you know, home from training and especially looking to do like your first launch. If you feel anxious about, you know, flying, try to find somebody to, to fly with. I know how hard this is. I, I don't even, I don't even know how to tell you how to do this. I saw no one, no other pilots in my area that also flies a paramotor. I found somebody who to fly with just through dumb luck. I was kiting at the park 
and this guy came up to me and said, hey, you know, I've, I've been doing this for 20 years and, and now that's, that's who I fly with. I still don't even know if I, if, if I'm going to go back into doing this. Like I said, my, my ultimate goal was to deal with the anxiety first. And I'm, and I'm so glad I did because, um, I had a lot of other issues going on and I want to talk about those in the next video. You know, I, I got in it a pretty bad way. I was, I was in a pretty bad spot. The thing that helped me out the most was you making an appointment with my doctor and getting a prescription for an anti-anxiety medication called citalopram. This has been life-changing and it's so much so that I want to do a, a my next video I want to be just a video just focusing on that part of it and how how different my life is now. You know what what life was before and what life is now like now because this has been the greatest thing that's that's happened to me in in recollection. I, I'm so glad that I took the time to do this. I'm in, I'm in a much better place now. And if I, you know, I haven't made any plans to launch, but if Tom was to text me and say, do you want to meet at the airport? It would be a, so much easier now. And if I would have done this before I went to training, I know training would have been a thousand times easier. I, I, I can't, I can't even tell you, <laughs> tell you how, how much better I feel and how more in control I am than I used to be. And if you are dealing with issues of anxiety and you're thinking about doing training to learn how to fly a paramotor, talk to your doctor and, and seriously consider taking citalopram. This has been great. I really wish I would have done this um, before I took my training because if that had been the case, the last two years would have been drastically different. I'm gonna wrap this up now. I, I really appreciate you sticking with this to the end. Thanks so much for watching this. Please let me know what thoughts you have down below and take care of yourself.